Hey there. Uh, a bunch of weeks ago, we did a video on gradient descent, and I just picked a bunch of problems to run, uh, run solving using that algorithm. One of which is was a logistic regression problem, and I was asked some questions on that. So I thought I would do a simpler video focusing just on logistic regression. And in the gradient descent video, I just did like a multi-parameter fit, which is why I went back a couple weeks ago and did like multivariate linear uh, regression, so that you're kind of familiar with the vectorization and how, how that type of code would work. So I want to do a simple um, kind of a hand-waving explanation of how logistic regression works and just come up with a simple toy problem and, and work through it. So this should be a pretty quick video, uh, at least by my standards. Um, so let us just jump into a notebook and get it, get to it. Okay, so this was the problem we did a few weeks ago. Uh, again, logistic regression, it's a classification problem. Uh, our training data were these blue dots and red dots, and the problem essentially was if given a new dot to classify it as either blue or red. And this problem was a little more difficult because there are two, two independent variables here. And so that meant in all the coding down here, we had to do some uh, vector manipulation, just like we did in that previous, uh, the last video I did on linear regression, where we fit a plane to, to data. And without any justification, I just kind of defined the sigmoid function, um, the parameter vector, and how we're going to parameterize things. And I just said the cost function was this and its gradient was given by this. So what I want to do is just do a simple problem where instead of two uh, degrees of freedom here, an X, an X and a Y or whatever you want to call it, it's X1, X2, uh, we just do one and I'm just going to provide some hand-waving justifications for these equations. So let us just start in a new notebook now and get to it. Okay, so I did my imports here, nothing fancy, just numpy, matplotlib. And I created some data here, just generated a bunch of random uh, numbers and categorized them uh, as either blue or red, zero or one. And I also did some pre-processing of that data to put it into the form we talked about in the previous uh, multidimensional linear uh, regression video. So just for, just for bookkeeping's sake, I put an X and Y label on these uh, axes. And as a bit of nomenclature, I'm going to use P of X for now. And P of X is the probability of getting a one if you were to draw, draw a random sample from, from this kind of distribution we have here. Uh, it follows then, since this is, this is a binary problem, that the probability of getting a zero, in other words, getting one of these blues, is one minus P. So I wrote that down here. And now logistic regression tends to model, or reg logistic regression models the log of the odds as being a linear relationship. So the odds are, is just the P, uh, it's the probability of getting a 1 divided by the probability of getting a 0. And phrasing the problem like this just has some advantages in, it doesn't, um, it, it allows you to avoid having to put a lot of constraints and doing a lot of more um, difficult types of optimizations on this problem. And I'm also going to define h of x to be this, this linear equation here. Now, if we solve for this, let's just solve this equation, kind of talk through how, uh, what would happen if we solve for p. Well, if we exponentiate this, we get p um, divided by 1 minus p, and you get e to the e to the h. So let me just shut off the recording and type in what the result would be. So I'm solving this equation here for p. So this is the result you get here. P is equal to 1 divided by this quantity, 1 plus e to the minus h of x. Now that should look awfully familiar to us from uh, the gradient descent video where we defined the sigmoid function. Where is it? Somewhere around here. Here it is. So that function that we just derived, P of x, is essentially the sigmoid function. So... Um, the probability of getting a 1 is essentially given by this sigmoid, sigmoid function. So let me copy and paste the sigmoid function from that previous video in there along with some plotting things. So let's maybe make this, I don't know, minus 7 to 7. So you see you get this S-shaped curve. So remember that the argument of this function is going to be some sort of linear, a linear equation here. So let's just see what happens visually if we, if we uh, fool around with this x value here. So let's go down here and just say what, is, what happens if we multiply it times 10. So you get a much steeper transition area here. So if we come back up here and add, I don't know, let's add in 
add in a five, I guess. Plus five. You see we begin shifting it over to the left. Let's make that uh, instead of a five, a ten. And if this were a minus 10, we'd be moving it over to the right. Okay, so let's just get rid of the plotting stuff here and keep our sigmoid function. Okay, so now our task is to choose these slopes and intercepts, this theta 1 and theta 0. Uh, how do we do that? Well, if we look at our data here, what we can do is try to choose those parameters such that for each of these blue dots where um, y is equal to zero, we want to uh, we want to choose these numbers such that the probability p, remember p is the probability of drawing a one, so we want to choose p such that it is as close to zero as possible. Uh, to phrase it another way, we want to make sure that one minus p is as close to one as possible. And then we go up to these red ones, and we want to make sure that P is as close to 1 as possible. And we're going to assume that these are all independent events, uh, so that the, this uh, total probability is just the product of each of the individual uh, probabilities. So the probability that this is equal to 0 times the probability of this one equal to 0, and so on. So let me come down here and just uh, write, it, write it out. So this is the probability that we are interested in. It's the probability that we get the uh, blue values. In other words, the probability that we see a zero times the probability that we get a one. Uh, instead of writing it like this, we can combine these two, um, these two uh, product statements into this one, one down here. So we're summing from one to m, or sorry, we're taking the product from of i equals one to i equals m. Um, and when y is equal to, remember y is either 0 or 1, so when y is 0, this product, this uh, term here goes to 1, and we're just left with this here, which gives us this, this part of the probability here. Likewise, when y is equal to 1, uh, 1 minus 1 is 0, so this whole term goes to 1, and we're just left with essentially this term here. So this is the probability we want to actually maximize. So I hope this makes sense. This is kind of where I wish I had something like a uh, whiteboard or some sort of uh, a way to actually write this out. It's kind of hard to, uh, to talk through it in a notebook. But in practice, we don't really want to deal with this. I hope there's an equal sign here that should not be there. Uh, go away, equal sign. Uh, in practice, we don't want to deal with this because it's difficult to, to, to handle the product. So in practice, what we do is we maximize the log of this. So if you remember from high school algebra, the log of products will give you a bunch of sums, which is a lot easier to deal with. So let's uh, write out the log of this. So after taking the log, this is what we get. You know, And remember, this is essentially the log of a times b is equal to the log of a plus the log of b. So that's all we're doing here. Uh, so this is the quantity we want to maximize. Now this should look pretty familiar to you from our last, uh, from the last time we talked about logistic regression. Our cost function was this. So you see that these two things are essentially identical. Remember that our probability is actually this function h of x, uh, uh, h sub theta here uh, of x. That's the sigmoid function. And the main difference between this equation and this is the minus signs, but remember we have a function, we have an algorithm gradient descent that finds the minimum, minimum of a function, and we want to maximize this function. So to maximize it with a code that does a minimization, we have to take the negative of that. So that's where that minus sign here and here come from. And also this is scaled down by the number of data points, which is often done. It's just a, a scaling factor. It doesn't really affect the position of the, of the max or min so just writing this out explicitly, we're substituting in the sigmoid function h uh, for our probabilities. We are multiplying this term by minus 1 and dividing by the number of data points. And that just gives us our, our cost function as a function of theta. And for gradient descent, we need the derivative. And so that is just this down here. Now, aside from copying in the functions from the previous video, uh, we are ready to basically solve this, this problem here. So let us go down. Let's do it in this cell, and I'm going to copy and paste the cost, fu uh, the, the cost function, the 
gradient function and the gradient descent code into this cell down here. So here we are. We already have the sigmoid function. Here's our gradient descent code. It's pretty pretty straightforward. Uh, our cost function, this 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 J function up here, um, and the gradient down here. So we don't actually need this cost function uh, except for maybe debugging purposes, but, but but we do need the gradient. So we are now set to run this. And now since this is a simple linear model, where's my linear equation? Where's my linear, oops, wrong sheet. Where's my linear equation? Right here. Our theta vector only has two parameters, so we need our initial guess. So let's come down here and we'll just set the initial guess to zero. So theta is equal to np dot zeros. And um, we have two, two of these and we want to make it a column vector as per the discussion in the last video on multidimensional linear regression. So let's make sure that runs and now we should just be able to call our cost function. So let's go theta count is equal to uh, do we want to do anything else? Do we want to set the learning rate and the uh, maximum number of iterations? Um, let's just tweak those later. Let's just see if this runs without any issues. Apparently it does. So let's print out our uh, calculator values of theta. So print theta. <laughs> Open parenthesis. Theta. Okay, so I just had my computer crash. It's been acting up a lot recently. I think there's something wrong with the video driver, but no matter how I reinstall it or update it or configure it, it still crashes with some some degree of regularity. Uh, but before I started the video again, I uh, was just playing around with some of these hyperparameters that we wrote into our uh, uh, gradient descent code. So the gamma, which uh, machine, lear machine learning people call the learning rate, and the maximum number of iterations. And I was getting different values of theta for every, every, uh, every different choice of parameter. So what I did to debug this was I came back up to the gradient descent function and I calculated the cost function for every step in the iteration. Now this particular way I coded it is very inefficient, so it kind of makes it run slow, but it gets the job done at least for these simple problems. So I added that to the output here and I plotted it and I uh, played with the hyperparameters here until this uh, converged to basically a, a, a constant level. So these are our hyperparameters here. So theta one or theta zero is minus 10 and theta is roughly plus 10. Okay, so what does that mean? So let me come down here and actually pull those out. I uh, called those theta. So let me uh, just do theta zero equals theta zero and theta one is equal to theta one. Okay. So what do these mean? Well, our model up here, where, 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 what is it? This gives us the probability for a given x and theta that that we're we're predicting a certain uh, value in either a zero or one. So if we had an x value, if we were given a new x value and say that value was point seven five, that should give us a probability close to zero. Because we're going to remember that this probability is the probability of being a one. So let's come down here and actually plug this in. So let's just say uh, h is equal to theta. Come on, h is equal to theta zero. Uh, what did I say? Zero point seven five. Where, 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 where? Yeah, let's just do zero seven five. Uh, plus zero point seven five times theta 1 and let's print out sigmoid of h. So we get a number pretty close to zero. It's a 7% chance of, of uh, being a zero. And also if we came down here and made this a 1.75, this should be a number very close to one. And indeed it is. So in our previous video, when we did logistic regression via the gradient descent thing, we came up with this boundary line between the reds and the blues here. Uh, now, obviously this is a two-dimensional plot. So this line is just, you know, it has a, a, a it has 
direction in both uh, x and y, uh, x, whatever you want to call it, so x1, x2, x or y directions. But <clears throat> so where did this line come from? Well, if we go back here, we could say wh what we're doing is we're choosing a blue dot if the probability, probability is less than one half and a red dot if it's greater than one half. So our dividing line is basically the 50%. So if we were to set this sigmoid equal to zero, we should get a value of one half. Let's just explicitly prove that down here. Uh, sigmoid of zero, one half. So we, what value of this line where is our line equation, line equation, line equation? Here we go. What value of this gives us zero? So we would solve for uh, the x value that, that sets that equation equal to zero. So let me get rid of this, and I'm going to change this and just uh, make it a markdown cell and write out some stuff so that it is clear. I will probably edit this out of the recording. So this is our linear equation here, and obviously it's just a trivial algebra to rearrange and get x is equal to, or, or dividing x between the reds and the blues is equal to minus theta 0 over theta 1. So let's just come down here, and I don't know what we call it, uh, x0 is equal to uh, minus theta 0 divided by theta 1. And this does not have an underscore, does it? And let's print out that x0. So about 0.98, very close to 1, which would be about right right here, which is what we'd expect. In fact, I'm going to, what am I going to do? I'm going to recreate this plot uh, down here. So I'm just going to copy all that code, paste it in here. It should generate that same plot. And I'm just going to put a vertical line at... Uh, this x is 0. So I'm going to actually do, because this is a vector, I'm just going to, yeah, I'll just leave it. No, I'll do this. x0 zero equals x0. Zero. 0. Uh, let's make sure that it actually works. Print x0. Okay, there's our value. Let's come down here and just add a vertical line uh, where that 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 is. So there's a convenient command in matplotlib, so plt.v, I believe it's called v-lines. Yes, uh, the point where you want the vertical line in the x direction, which is our x0, and then the starting and uh, ending uh, y value. So what I'm going to do is just draw it between 0 and 1 and put it where x0 is. So there's our dividing line. Anything to the left of that gives us a blue. Anything to the right of that gives us a red, according to this model. Okay, I think this is a good place to call it quits. And as an aside, I think I'm glad I went back and I played around with those hyperparameters. Um, you should never take at face value the numbers that are spit out by, by these things. You should always double check and try to triple check them if you can. I mean, I've been doing this uh, numerical computation professionally for, for years and sometimes I still get bitten by that. I assume some piece of code is giving the correct number when indeed it is not. Sometimes there, there are very subtle errors and you think the number is precise because it looks it looks reasonable in context, but again, always, always double check. So I will clean up that notebook, uh, upload it to GitHub as usual. Uh, if there are any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. And uh, until next time, we will see you.